Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the prelude to the Protestant Reformation. Last time we were talking just a little bit about the church and the idea of the church as an institution. Also mentioned that there are some of us today that don't really like this. Well, it's not just today. There just so happens to be a man in the 1300s named of John Wycliffe, who also did not like the idea of the church as an institution, uh, the visible church, the church that you can see with its hierarchies, structures, buildings, but rather the church is something that is invisible. Uh, the invisible church was something that a guy named Wycliffe started um, arguing in favor of. You see, Wycliffe was an English priest and he had been reading in Romans, Romans chapters eight and nine, where Paul talks about those of us being predestined to salvation um, are those who are truly the loved of God. Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. We'll talk more about predestination and this sort of thing when we get to John Calvin uh, on down the line. Uh, but he said the true church wasn't the visible church. The Pope could be an antichrist for all we know, uh, just because he's Pope does not make him truly Christ vicar or even truly part of the church. And so the true church is the one that is invisible. Now, of course, the Catholic Church isn't going to like this because of several different things. Firstly, um, it might be wrong. You know, the Catholic Church can come along and say, no, Christ appointed the 12 apostles. And we visibly see that this authority has been passed down from generation of bishops on down to the next generation. And this is just simply the way that it works. Another possibility as to why the Catholic Church could be upset by this is because it could inherently challenge their authority, right? If, if we can't see the church, if the church is truly invisible, then um, where, where do we find the scriptures? Where do we find the interpretation of the scriptures? Well, um, we would find it in the hands of the people because the people are the ones who are part of the church. Um, it belongs in the hands of all people. And so Wycliffe began making this argument. It was an argument that, that Luther would agree with to some extent later on down the line, that people ought to be able to read the Bible, that it should be in their language. Um, and after he dies, his followers, who were called Lollards, uh, they end up translating the Bible into English. And of course, uh, this Bible exists. It's actually illegal to own it. And so people who own them secretly uh, hide them. Um, and so the church does not like this, but this is not ultimately what gets John Wycliffe in trouble. We talked last time about church authority and governmental authority. Paul says all authority has been appointed by God and therefore we should submit to the governing authorities. Well, um, John Wycliffe is gonna come along and challenge, uh, challenge this. So he says that rulers are appointed by, by God, this is true, but uh, there is fruit. Just because someone is, is in power does not mean that they are truly appointed by God, but rather, um, but rather the truly appointed God, uh, servant of God is one who serves others. These rulers are put there by God to serve others, and you therefore um, can challenge rulers who are using their power to ingratiate themselves, to enrich themselves. And of course, this made, uh, you know, the church got mad last time. Well, now the rulers are mad at John Wycliffe because of the fact that he is undermining their authority to rule. Look, if the king is God's appointed uh, ruler on earth um, for whatever jurisdiction he has, well, then there it is. There's nothing you can say about it. He just has ultimate power because God gives him that power. But now all of a sudden, if the king is held to some sort of a standard uh, that he has to serve the people and not himself, now all of a sudden this challenges his uh, potential to have authority and power. And what does this mean, right? This, this means potentially this could have revolutionary consequences. If the king is not, in your view, serving you well enough, then potentially, what does that mean that you could do? Submit to the governing authorities because they've been appointed by God, unless, of course, they're serving themselves rather than you, in which case they're maybe not appointed by God. And then, you know, maybe you should 
try to kick them out of power or hang them or chop off their heads, or at the very least declare yourself independent. Anyway, this does not make the governing authorities particularly happy. Now, if you want to know what gets John Wycliffe in true trouble, it's communion. It's not these other things. These other things are frustrating and whatever for the Catholic Church. But communion is what really gets him in trouble. Look, east-west, it doesn't matter. Going back to the earliest days of the church, the church believes that the communion of uh, the communion is front and central. Uh, the church believes that Christ is present in some way. Uh, the church believes that the communion is sacramental. That there is an impartation of God's grace within the elements in some way. And so what does John Wycliffe do? Well, uh, before we get all excited that we found our first Protestant here, we don't. Um, John Wycliffe accepts that the communion is sacramental. He believes that there is a means of grace within the communion, but he does reject uh, transubstantiation. And he basically says, look, of course, bread and wine are there. Look, there they are. Can't you see them? And so he says, rather, communion is like the mystery of the incarnation. God entered full manhood in the person of Jesus Christ while retaining his full godhood. So, too, does Christ enter the bread and the wine. But the bread and the wine remain there fully also. It's 100 percent Jesus's body and blood, and it's also 100 percent bread and wine. Okay, that sounds nice. Now the Eastern Orthodox are going to say what here? It's too defined. Stop trying to define this. Wycliffe, you're wrong. And Roman Catholic Church, you're wrong too. Uh, however, the Catholic Church does not like this because um, when Jesus says, this is my body, this is my blood, uh, they say, well, yeah, there it is, period. Um, it becomes Christ's body and blood and there's nothing else there. Okay, so what happens to poor old John Wycliffe? Well, he dies in full communion of the church, though some people considered some of his ideas a bit heretical at the time. But he wasn't real close to Rome. He was way out there in England. It's hard to kill people when they're up there in England. you got to go a long ways before you can hang them. Uh, and so um, he dies uh, in full communion with the church, but his ideas are written down and the, the ideas are sort of secret, um, but they're passed around quietly. And it helps to grow ideas of um, the, that you can maybe rebel a little bit against your prince or uh, that the church uh, is invisible rather than visible or that maybe communion isn't transubstantiated. All these things cause some problems. And so a number of years after, I believe it was almost a hundred years after he, uh, he had died uh, and he'd been buried on church grounds, of course it makes sense, right? So Christians bury, historically they do not cremate that's what the pagans do. That's what the Greeks do. Christians bury, waiting for the resurrection. And better yet, if you're buried on hallowed ground, consecrated ground, ground that is next to the church, so that your bodies are close to the communion, uh, the Eucharist that is being celebrated weekly or daily in the, in the church. Uh, and if you are uh, considered to be um, of high enough importance, then you could your remains could even be laid within the church itself, and, and so so that you are in the same room as the Eucharist. This is not going to be the case for John Wycliffe because uh, they excommunicate him a hundred years later, dig him up, uh, cremate what was left of him, and then throw the chunks that were left over from that into the Thames River. I guess there's no resurrection for him. So Wycliffe was undoubtedly one of the precursors to the Protestant Reformation. Let's talk a little bit about John Huss. John Huss. John Huss had read Wycliffe, and he came to the conclusion that an unworthy pope was not one to be obeyed. Once again, revolutionary consequences if you take Wycliffe's reasoning far enough. He said that the Bible is the final authority and that the Bible, the Holy Scriptures, uh, now before you go thinking about your 66 book canon, remember that hasn't been landed on yet in the 1400s, uh, but the Holy Scriptures in general are the uh, final authority and can be used to judge popes. Uh, and then the Catholic Church invited him to have this discussion at this council. But this council, he was, it wasn't a council at all. Uh, he was arrested, he was tried for heresy, he was found guilty and then he was burned at the stake. Yes, would have happened to Luther too, a hundred years later, had the printing press not been, been on his side and had uh, his, um, his prince, Prince Frederick 
fee wise, not also been on his side, uh, the same thing would have likely happened to Luther. And so this is helping us to get theologically set up for the Protestant Reformation. But before we get there, I want to talk really quickly about, um, about Christian art. Pre-Renaissance and Renaissance. Whoa. Thanks, Michelangelo. And along with that, we're going to finish this little lecture with a short hymn performed not by me, but by last year's kindergarten class. All right, take it away, kids. Ha, ha, ha. 